thank you for joining us today and taking time to uh, join our Adventures in Edible Landscaping episode here of the Four Seasons Gardening webinar. And uh, so to get started today, uh, we're going to be talking about edible landscaping, which is kind of a fun, I think, landscaping gardening topic and concept. So to get started, we'll be looking at an overview of the concept of landscape design using edible plants as a feature in an ornamental landscape or what would otherwise be more of an ornamental landscape. And we'll also cover some tips on how to incorporate edible plants into the landscape. And then we'll look at some examples of these edible plants that also not only have an edible kind of food value, but also kind of have that visual and ornamental quality to the plants. And I really became more interested in the potential for use of edible plants as a visual and ornamental feature in landscaping as I became more involved with kind of small scale agriculture in college and uh, getting into designing landscapes for small spaces, which I still like to like to do as maybe just more of a hobby. So that really kind of ties into uh, edible landscaping and new topics go hand in hand. And so in small scale urban agriculture, the use of efficient space. So the efficient use of space is really important. It's kind of key as it is with landscape design for small spaces and so edible landscaping helps to not only create a visually unique environment, but it also offers that added benefit of growing some of our own fresh herbs and produce and other crops at home. Okay, so when we say edible, what we're referring to is plants that are commonly consumed by people. So pretty much every plant is gonna be consumed by some kind of creature, but here we're really defining edible landscaping as that which focuses on tasty plants, mostly for human consumption, and that are also gonna have that ornamental value. And edible landscaping uh, may also be termed as foodscaping. You, almost, you, 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 you might also hear it as foodscaping, but generally this kind of design practice combines fruit and nut trees berry bushes, vegetables, herbs, and edible flowers into the landscape. And in my presentation, we're kind of going to lump herbs and flowers together. I think that they have some common kind of qualities to them. So we'll put those together in a category. And uh, this can be used in, in uh, obviously, of course, the home garden setting, but it can also be used in more public kind of gardens. So what are some of the main benefits and why should we want to include ornamental edible plants into our home gardens or landscapes? So one big benefit is to have convenient and easy access to fresh, healthy, local food sources right in our own backyard. So easy access, easy to go take, take advantage of. And we can also more closely control what is going into or onto the plants and into the soil where our food is coming from. And that might be of concern. So that way we know more about what we're consuming in our, in our food and our produce. And if there are some unique or unusual varieties of herbs or other crops, we can save money on our grocery bill and have closer, cheaper access maybe to unique things that maybe we can't find at the grocery store. And so that offers us a wider variety of food choices. And so that's not to mention gardening is just really great for our health and it's fun because we get to get outside, get out in the sun, uh, be active. And we also get that added benefit of producing fresh foods from our own landscape and including it into our ornamental uh, landscape that might already be there. So those are some of the main kind of benefits and, and positive things about edible landscaping. Now we'll cover some more of kind of the practical pieces of information here. So kind of the logistics and practical considerations when we're planning 
to introduce some edible plants into an ornamental landscape, or maybe we'd even like to do a completely edible ornamental installation or feature in our landscape. And so we need to be aware of a few different needs of plants that we're going to be growing for not only their edible, but also their ornamental value. So perhaps uh, we're growing something for its flowers and its fruits and its foliage. So there's, there's a few kind of environmental needs that might be different for edible plants as opposed to just purely ornamental plants or specimens that we might have out in our landscape. And so these environmental needs, which are also called cultural requirements more specifically, so for most fruit and vegetable species, they're gonna need more sun, six hours at the least, between six to seven, seven and a half hours of full sun. And so that's about the level of light they need to be fully productive and fully healthy and, and, and functioning as, as, as at their highest level and producing food and, and uh, foliage and flowers and all, all that good stuff. And there are though some exceptions with edibles as there are with a lot of plants. Uh, there's some exceptions for shady locations that we can also in, introduce some edibles into these spots. So some examples are ramps, which are also called wild leeks, and that's a really popular kind of trendy edible right now. But we'll talk a little bit more about what ramps are down the line here. And uh, salad greens are another one that's great for shade and cooler conditions too, maybe in the spring and fall. Uh, low bush or half high bush blueberry, which we'll talk more about. And huckleberry is another one. Another common name is sparkleberry, which is a kind of a funny name, but it's a kind of an understory, more woodland species. But these are all going to be things that are more shade tolerant than, than more of the common edible species. And so for something like blueberries, there may need to be some soil adjustment. And we'll talk about that when we get to more detail on blueberries. Another important factor, space. Space is really important. It's a, it's a really critical factor to keep in mind. And we need to ensure that the plants that we're installing and spending money on will have, a, and time, will have enough space to thrive and to grow into their mature sizes. So it's really important that they have space. And so for that reason, dwarf varieties of trees and shrubs are a really great option for small spaces and containers and even some, some types of plants are determinant. So there may be some, some varieties of determinant vegetables like tomatoes or peppers. And we call these determinant because they only grow to a certain size while as opposed to indeterminate, which you may hear that term indeterminate, that means that it's just gonna keep growing as long as conditions are good. So a good example of indeterminate would be pumpkins. Pumpkin vines just keep growing as long as the conditions are are optimal and, and they just don't slow down until, until they get killed off by frost. And so for containers or small spaces, these determinant types of plants are a really great option for containers. So for small spaces, some other good options for kind of using space in a smart way are trellises, arbors, fencing. Uh, these are all going to be great for growing edible plants in smaller spaces so we can kind of capitalize on, on our vertical space as well and add some other kind of dimension to, to creating kind of outdoor spaces. And for this reason, edible landscaping really lends itself well to containers and vertical gardening and in small backyards or decks where, where ground space is going to be limited. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the options for containers in, in and in down the line here in a few slides. And so probably the most important feature that we're the most aware of in a landscape is the visual impact and overall effect that plants have a, have in, when they're in an arrangement in a landscape. And, but this can still be a pretty subjective opinion. So beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as they say. So it's a good idea to make sure that whatever you're selecting and thinking about growing is going to match with your visual taste and maybe your, your food tastes as well. And so with that in mind, uh, there's a wide variety of options to choose from in edible plants. And a few examples are apple trees as a good alternative for dogwood trees. Now dogwood trees are not 
an undesirable species by any means, but if we're looking to introduce maybe more edible things than an apple tree with its, its really kind of nice, pretty pink, uh, abundant blooms in the spring, that could be a, a replacement uh, or, or an alternative for our dogwood trees. And uh, an interesting alternative for burning bush can be blueberry bushes, which uh, kind of have a similar fall color. They, they turn into a nice orange reddish color in the fall. And uh, as an alternative to Japanese maple, and again, not to pick on Japanese maple, it's, it's one of my favorite ornamental trees. But if we're looking for an edible alternative, a good alternative is elderberry or black elderberry as a replacement and it's got a similar kind of wispy leaf texture and kind of that dark reddish almost purple color uh, to the foliage and the flowers also have a nice pink color to them in, in early summer. So those are just some examples of kind of alternatives for edible plants in the landscape. So now we'll look at a few more design considerations here before we move on. And just a few more notes to keep in mind when we're thinking about the layout of plants in a garden. Again, keeping in mind spacing and location. That's going to be really important for plants to thrive, especially with natives. If we're using perennial natives, they tend to get kind of large, some of them. Some of them can be quite large and spread and kind of need a lot of space to do that. So we need to make sure that we're planning for that, for that needed space so that they can kind of reach their potential. And also making sure the plants have easy access to water. So the concept of a, of a nice raised bed way out in the middle of a field kind of comes to mind where, where it, it becomes uh, out of sight, out of mind. So plants, even native plants still have a establishment period where they're gonna need supplemental watering in the first year or two. So having close, easy access to water will be important. And one other thing to consider is how much of something you reasonably think you'll need. Uh, so maybe you, you might not need as many tomato plants as, as, you, as you might think. So an example, I know a farmer who grows about a, a tennis court worth of tomato plants every year and only the, 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 the tomato plants on the outside row end up getting used and the ones in the middle are I guess end up as fertilizer. So kind of just planning to, to know what we'll need and how much we think we can reasonably use, maybe share it with the neighbors or if, if we're okay with sharing with animals as well, that's fine. And then along with these factors, it's, it's always good to use uh, good sound cultural practices like crop rotation, especially with annual vegetables. So that's gonna help to avoid uh, the buildup of disease pressure in the soil. So if, if we keep growing the same kind of family of plant that's going to kind of create a vector for those diseases. So just rotating out families of crops is a, is a great idea in our gardens. And then mulching. Mulching and composting also help to improve soil health and quality over time. So those are just a few kind of general practices that you want to be practicing anyway. And as I previously touched on, Edible landscaping really kind of is, is, a, is a good application. So it really lends itself well to container gardening for small spaces. And uh, container gardening is really a wider topic to cover on its own. And, 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 and definitely educators do cover that in other Four Seasons webinars and, pre and presentations. But just briefly to mention, there are a ton of options in the size and types of materials used for containers. And containers are really easy to change and, and alterate within the season. And so they're, they're easy to access and easy to work with throughout the year. And their containers are a great option for patios, uh, small spaces that might also be close to the kitchen. So, and now moving into uh, some examples of herbs and flowers. So this is just a public service announcement mainly for edible flowers, uh, that's really where we need to be careful. So gardeners enjoy a wide range of flowers, mainly for their aesthetic visual beauty. And many of these flowers, annuals and even perennials, they may be toxic. And it, even if something's native, it still may have toxicity and, and cause, cause issues if it's consumed. 
So let's just uh, make sure that we have a positively identified flower before consumption. Make, make sure that uh, you've consulted a professional if you're not sure, uh, so that we can avoid eating something that wouldn't be good for us. So some examples of toxic flowers are lantanas, uh, foxgloves, uh, of course, things in the solanaceous family. Uh, any of those flowers or foliage is, is toxic. Daffodils are toxic as well, and uh, probably a lot of others. So with, with flowers, we need to just be sure of what we're consuming. And of course, when in doubt, I'd say just don't, don't consume that flower. And with that, we'll talk about some flowers and herbs here. And after that, we'll talk about some, some nice vegetable options and examples, and then we'll look at fruiting trees and shrubs. And at the end, we'll also look at a few examples of some landscape, edible landscape designs here in uh, Carbondale, in Southern Illinois, where, where I live. Okay, so we've got here borage to start. And borage is an annual, na native to the Mediterranean. It's a, it's a good, easy annual to grow, can do full sun to part shade, and it's got, it's got all these nice features that we're looking for in an edible ornamental. It's got nice, soft foliage, uh, pretty pink flower, or uh, pur bluish purple flowers in summer, and, and it's also very, it's got a good edible quality to it. So it's, it's kind of got the fragrance and taste of cucumber, so a kind of a refreshing flavor there. And it, it can be eaten raw or cooked. And it's also got pollinator value as well. So it attracts uh, a lot of different kinds of pollinators. Also disease resistant. So it checks off a lot of the, 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 the good boxes or beneficial boxes that we're looking for here. And it's, and it's even got some, some value as a, as a uh, plant that helps repel pests. So it's kind of what we might call a a uh, biological uh, pest control kind of kind of uh, species that has that quality to it. Uh, so very versatile, good in it within an herb mix and or in a wild garden. It is self seeding, so it, it 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 will come back every year probably in in the right spot, even though it is an annual, but it, it still may reseed itself. So be aware of that. And then I've got nasturtium here. Now nasturtium is probably one of my favorite edible kind of flowers, you could say, and it is a trailing or it's either a trailing or kind of a bushing type. And the one that we see here is maybe more of the bushing type, but the trailing type would do really well for like a trellis or something to climb up on and kind of hang down on. So, so something that can, it can kind of flow over and it's pretty low maintenance, but it tends to do better with more shade. I, if it's in too much sun, it just kind of kind of toasts it and it just doesn't do much. So uh, a little bit of shade or in afternoon shade is going to really help this one out. And it's one of my favorite flavored kind of flavors of edible flowers. It's kind of got a, a peppery kind of zing to it a little bit and uh, it's savory too. And the flowers are, the flowers are really interesting because they've got nectar in them, but they also kind of have that peppery flavor. So you kind of get the sweet and the little bit of a, uh, uh, kick to it. So a very, a very nice tasting flower there. Again, very versatile for trellises or as a more of a bushier kind of mounding plant in a container. And the leaves and flowers are edible. And I have these together because I, I think they'd be really good in like a salad together. Okay, next we have calendula. And calendula is an interesting plant. It's native to Europe and maybe Eurasia. But, and it's similar to marigold, but it's different enough to be in its own genus. So this is Calendula officinalis, and so that's as opposed to Tagetus. So that's the genus of marigold. But it is commonly called a pot marigold, but probably more commonly Calendula. And it's popular, or it was very popular in England as a, a garden herb in the time of Shakespeare. And so that's interesting. And it doesn't get too huge. It stays about two feet tall, two foot spread. And the flowers have a, a very nice herbal kind of flavor to them. The leaves are maybe bitter, a little bit more bitter, but it's used as maybe a seasoning for soups and rice dishes, things like this. Also, it's got a very nice uh, color to it. So maybe it's used in a, in a, for uh, coloring 
or, or dye or something like that. And so it's a pretty versatile herb, pretty, pretty widely used. And uh, it is also self-seeding and it's uh, good as a intercropping plant. It probably has some similar qualities to it like Miracle does where it's got some, some sort of uh, biological pest control qualities to it. it. It may attract a certain insect that's a predator of something, a pest, something like that but it also attracts other beneficial insects. Okay, blue giant hyssop. And so this one I think of as more of an herb as well. And this one's a prairie native. So if you, if you wanna integrate some edible native plants into your landscape, into your flower beds, this is a good one. And it gets about, it's kind of a mounding kind of shape here, four by four feet. Very low maintenance, good heat tolerance, like many of the prairie natives are. Good pollinator, uh, a good, good a pollinator plant attracts our, our, our favorite kinds of pollinators. And it, it's, it's got an aromatic kind of scent and good for herbal teas, jellies, these kind of things. And it's also apparently good for, good for baking. Uh, the seeds are, are tasty and baked goods and good for kind of good smelling. So good for potpourris. And uh, applications here are wildflower gardens, herb gardens, butterfly gardens. So it's a good a good addition to a pollinator garden, an edible pollinator garden. And it's got these, it, it's got flat, these catkins here that are sort of almost similar to, reminds me of uh, Liatris or Prairie Blazing Star a little bit. So that's a neat one. That's a neat native. Okay, so now we're going to move into some vegetables with ornamental value here. And we'll start with alliums. So who doesn't like garlic and onions, right? I'm not everybody, but I'm a big fan. And in general, humans are one of the few animals that enjoy onions and garlic. And they're also fairly easy to grow. So garlic and onions are, they're, they're not really, they don't suffer from a lot of the same pest predation and rodent predation as, as a lot of others of our favorite kind of produce, our produce garden plants. And they can be left more or less unattended, but they, uh, some species of onion and garlic are prolific spreaders, so they will kind of take over a little bit if they're not kind of kept in check. But they're deer and rodent repellent, actually, and they repel some other soil microbes that we, that we don't like, and uh, low maintenance. So to harvest them, onions and garlic, they need to be kind of dug up, or, or sometimes onions can just be kind of popped out of the ground. But sometimes, like garlic, they need to be dug up to harvest. And uh, it's good to have for, for kind of these bulb type of garlic and onion kind of things, it's good to have a place in the shade to let them dry out with good air circulation for a couple days. So we just want to make sure that the outer skin dries up and that the full or the, 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 the green vegetation on top, the tops, dry up before we put them into long term storage. And kind of a general rule of thumb for harvest of garlic and onions is to wait till half of the green tops have kind of flopped over and started to turn brown in the fall. And that's a good indication that they're prime for harvest. But overall low maintenance, they can tolerate a little bit slightly more acidic soil in a well-drained soil and they can do full sun to a bit of shade. So these would be good for borders, you know, along the front of a, a bed. And there are a lot of alliums that have even kind of ornamental blue puffs of flowers too. Those are like the giant alliums. Those are going to be more for the more, more along ornamental. I don't know if the, the bulbs really have too much ornament, edible value, but those are more along purely ornamental. And we talked about ramps. So ramps are kind of something that could be a shade, a shady ground cover in the spring. And they're basically a wild spring onion. The whole plant's edible, but yeah, the, 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 the green tops and the bulbs are all edible. And the flavor is like a milder garlic is, is, is how I would describe it. And it's, it's one that you're probably not going to find in grocery stores because it's just such a short window of uh, harvest time for it. So that's one, if you wanted to try it out, you might have to grow it at home or catch it at the farmer's market. And then some other honorable, notable mentions here that are also great for edible gardens, but I kind of put them in their own category here is basil, basil pansies, or violas, or, or the flowers are edible, rosemary, thyme, dill. These, these kind of things, these more herb 
strictly herbs, kitchen herbs, that's again, it's kind of, it's, that would be its own, I think its own, worthy of its own presentation. But I just wanted to mention those. Those are also ornamental. Uh, rosemary and, and think lavender have ornamental value. And then a, a big one is echinacea that, that I wanted to point out is a, is a big pollinator plant. I mean, popular as in big and popular. Medicinal properties and the petals are also edible. But yeah, that's, that's one that you're going to see quite a bit in, as a medicinal uh, herb or flower. And I just have a few examples here of, of how these might be used. This is more, I guess, a garden layout, but it's got kind of some ornamental elements to it here. But you can see how this might be used in a border here. And then these are kind of these herb beds here, and they kind of are in their own little uh, greenhouse boxes. So that's a really neat kind of architectural feature where they're integrating the architecture of the building into the, into the beds. So that's really a, a neat feature there. Okay, we've just got a few more vegetable species now to look at. So asparagus here. Asparagus is, a, is an interesting one, and I think it's maybe the oldest ornamental edible plant used by man or used by humans. And dating back to the Roman times that it may have been used as somewhat of an ornamental plant, you could say, probably more for food, I think, but it does have this ornamental value. And the, if it's allowed to go to, to fern out or go to seed, which is, which is what it does when it goes to seed, it gets up to like five, I would say five feet by, by three feet, really. It gets quite tall when it goes to, when it ferns out. And it is continually blooming from spring or uh, early summer to fall. Now it's easy to grow, and it and it starts from crowns, but then those crowns will spread, and so that's something to be aware of because once it gets established, you'll have asparagus there pretty much forever, and it, and it'll spread out pretty easily on its own, and the spears. So if we're wanting to actually eat the spears, those are pretty much only going to be good up until. Uh, late May, maybe the first week of June, but after that, it's going to bolt or go to seed or fern out. And so then the spears become uh, woody and, and unpalatable. So they're no good for food at that point. But once they do fern out, they have this nice, wispy, airy kind of foliage, and they're, they, they've got their own kind of ornamental value at that point. And so they're great for massings or borders, uh, and it's got that kind of lacy texture. Okay, so another really popular favorite for uh, edible landscaping here is Swiss chard. And Swiss chard is really uh, awesome. It's versatile, comes in really neat colors. So some of the cultivars that have these really kind of bright red and yellow and orange colors are the bright lights or northern lights. Now the one we're looking at here Maybe it's just too early in the season and, and it's not quite as colorful, but it's, you can kind of see these yellow, bright yellow ribs here. And that is the yellow, bright yellow. That's the cultivar, bright yellow Swiss chard there. And earlier we saw a picture, I think, of the, of the bright lights or northern lights when we were talking about containers. And so it doesn't get too big. It's more of a foliage kind of plant. Uh, that's what we eat is the foliage of... Uh, Swiss chard. It's very low maintenance can, and, it, and it's great. It can handle humidity and summer heat and good for borders, cottage gardens, edgings. Uh, and it's great in, as we can see in mixed containers there. And so that is Swiss chard. All right, here we have a pretty neat little ornamental pepper cultivar. And the one we're looking at here, both of these are black pearl. This one is in a mixed bed here with some, or a mixed container rather. We got basil in here, nasturtium, and then we got our, our ornamental peppers there. And this is another example here with some dianthus in there. And you can see, you can start to see the small pep. There's one, let me see if I can get my pointer here and show you the, the actual fruit. And here we can kind of see in there the, the pepper there, it's like a small little black pepper. And I haven't tried them yet, but I don't know if it's extremely uh, pungent or spicy, it, it could be. So with these, you need to be careful of knowing how potent they're gonna be. Some might not have much flavor, some might be extremely 
uh, spicy. So just be cautious there. And some other varieties are Joker or Chester or Jester. This variety, Black Pearl, is pretty kind of low growing, so kind of low spreading. And they are great because they can tolerate a little bit of drought, but they're really heat tolerant. So if, if it's a full sun bed, this is a nice edible ornamental to, to as an addition. And good for borders because it is kind of smaller, so it might be a good uh, border to put in front of something a little bit taller and kind of that good color contrast there too. There's not too many things with such that dark, uh, a dark purple foliage. Okay, and this is one of my favorites for trellises or arbors, and that's the Scarlet Runner Bean. And it, it really does need to have something to be able to climb or vine up on, so a trellis or fence. And uh, if we're starting it indoors, we need to start them six weeks prior to the last frost. We want to get them out for the first kind of spring round of, of harvesting and, and growth in the summer for that kind of first, first wave. But they can be succession planted over the summer. So we could plant them again maybe a couple weeks ago. You could maybe plant them now and get a little bit out of them, but it might be a little bit late. In any case, uh, you can get a couple crops out of, out of these. And uh, the flowers are really showy and edible, and they're red in color. So the only trade-off is if we're eating the flowers, we don't get scarlet runner beans. So maybe, maybe grow some for the flower and grow some for the beans. And the beans are also, I think, red or scarlet in color. And uh, they're also attractive to pollinators. So uh, a great option for kind of uh, things where we're going to be using vertical space for on a fence or a tripod. So we'll look at an example of a tripod here in, in one of the ornamental landscape designs that I have a slide for. Uh, great for trellises or any kind of structure that, that uh, they can climb up on. It kind of has maybe a little bit more of a fancy or formal look. Okay, so now we're going to look at some of the fruiting shrubs with unique and interesting landscape value. Maybe the fruit and the flowers have some interesting landscape value. And most of these that we're gonna look at are natives to Illinois, or at least native to the Midwest. And so real quick, there seems to be some disagreement on the Sambucus nigra species. And according to Missouri Botanical Garden, it's listed as an invasive and I think that However, they're thinking about that. They're talking about a Sambuca species that's from Europe, which probably is invasive in the United States. However, on the IDNR website, this species is listed as a valuable and desirable Illinois native species with the scientific name Sambucus nigra canadensis. So I think there's just some dispute here over naming but I am confident that Sambuca canadensis is among the non-invasive desirable native plants of Illinois. And so for that reason, I think the black beauty elderberry is a cultivar of canadensis. So that's why it's in here. So that's kind of just my defense here for having it, but things, things change with, with botany. But anyway, this is the black beauty cultivar here of elderberry. And uh, it is in the IDNR listed as a perennial native. And it gets quite large. So 12 by 12, it's a larger uh, woodland kind of species and it tolerates pretty poor soils, wet areas, can withstand some flooding even. And it's got these really attractive pinkish white flowers in July that give way to the black elderberry clusters in the late summer and fall. And of course, elderberry is a, is a very historical edible plant with lots of different applications uh, for consumption and, and processing, great for jellies and jams and, and uh, even uh, turning, you know, using it for a beverage or something like that. But it attracts pollinators and it's got this neat kind of lacy foliage or wispy foliage. Now it does spread by root suckers, so it can kind of uh, spread by underground root kind of browsing or, or kind of, kind of uh, I guess, exploration of the underground roots where, where they're going to give rise to new plants out of their uh, underground root structures. And so need to make sure that it's going to have space for that. Now, now we can always uh, cut back the root suckers or, or the root sprouts, you could also call them, which are these 
kind of underground emerging new plants that, that arise from underground root structures. So we can cut them back in the spring or in the fall, much like you would, as an example, the crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle does the same thing, but they're pretty easy to remove if we don't want it to kind of spread and turn into a grove. So, so that's just some control for that one. But it's great for naturalized areas near kind of wetter areas, streams, ponds, or low spots, and kind of naturalized areas, or maybe as a background or a screen for, for a, a, a shorter plants. And then we have the Missouri gooseberry. And gooseberry is also a, it's an Illinois native. It is native to Illinois, although I think maybe it's more common in the lower half of Illinois and more so maybe even over into the Mark Twain kind of uh, natural forest area. But it is full sun to part shade. So these, these can withstand or, or a little bit more tolerant of shade. And this is a nice one because it's not quite as big as some of the other native edibles, perennials, shrubs. So it gets about four by four feet. That's, that's about how big the example that we have it out at my office is. And it's been there a few years. So uh, it does like kind of a more fertile, higher quality soil, of course. Most, most plants uh, do a little bit better in higher quality soil. Some though, you know, like the, the, like the elderberry, maybe likes a little bit poorer soil, probably prefers it. But uh, this one likes a little nicer soil with a little more organic matter. And it does have kind of white, nice showy flowers in late spring. And then it produces these kind of green, almost striped berries, but they're not ripe until they turn dark purple. And uh, they're attractive to a range of uh, pollinators and the berries are pretty, pretty decently edible and they can be eaten raw or jams, pies, these kind of things. And it's a, it's a very versatile for, for use in kind of open kind of woodland or savanna kind of things in a naturalized kind of, kind of garden or as, a, as like a shrub border. So one thing that this is good for, gooseberry, is good for a border if we want to keep out rodents or possibly even deer. It could even help keep deer out of a certain section of a garden because it's got these big kind of gnarly thorns on it. So it'll, it'll maybe help keep out some pests to an extent. So it could be a pest repellent border. And we've got a few more here and then we'll look at a few trees. And so black chokeberry, this is a really nice landscape shrub. And again, it, it, can, it can be smaller and, and uh, not quite as big as these others. And it's very flood tolerant, but it does create a lot of suckers. So it may spread out a bit more. And as I mentioned, we can cut back those suckers to control its spread. And it's got uh, these nice big white clusters of flowers in spring. And then it's got uh, clusters of kind of dark purple berries similar, I think what we're saying there is similar to elderberries in autumn, similar in color. And uh, it's got a lot of edible applications. Now, the, the choke berry, it's a perennial native and it's very astringent or, or really kind of bitter if you're going to eat it raw. You probably won't enjoy eating it raw, but it is one of the most highly concentrated fruits with uh, as far as antioxidants. It's got maybe the highest concentration per, per fruit of antioxidant. Uh, so that's interesting, but I, it's, it's one that needs to be processed. So you probably need to add sugar to whatever you're gonna use it in. And good for fall color, good, good fall color, uh, nice kind of orange yellow foliage in the fall. And it can be used as an accent, uh, maybe a focal point or, or as a border. In, or amassing even among some other kind of native kind of edible perennials. You could maybe mix it in with some, with some elderberry. And it's, it is a, a bit shade tolerant as well. Okay, now we have my favorite, the low bush or half high blueberry, which is a perennial and it's native to Illinois. So this one again, doesn't get too crazy big, tends to stay a little bit smaller and it's, it's once it's established, it does pretty well. It, 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 it's pretty low maintenance. And it does require, blue, blueberries need a little bit of acidity, but it offers great fruit, of course. I, I love blueberries and uh, it's one of my favorite fruits. And it's also got that nice fall color. 
And so we see here that it's got this duff or evergreen needle uh, mulch here. And that's fine. Pine needle mulch is, is fine. It's not hurting the blueberry, but it may not be doing a lot as far as controlling pH or lowering pH. So the pH that we're looking for is around 6 to 5.5 pH, which is a little bit on the acidic side. But the pine needles don't really add to that. So we may need to add some kind of amendment to, to really make sure that the pH is where it needs to be. And we can do that by adding something like sphagnum peat moss around, around the soil or mixing it into the top of the soil. We can also add a add some coffee grounds around the around kind of top dress with coffee grounds or we can actually just buy a blueberry fertilizer that's got the type of uh, fertilizer in there that's more acidifying to the soil. Now having said all that it's really a good idea to do a soil test first and then figure out the rate from that soil test we can figure out the rate a fertilizer or amendment needed to get to that desired 6 to 5.5 pH. And it's really a bad idea to start applying something without knowing first what's needed because the, the, the main issue that we run into is, is that it's really easy to go beyond the desired pH. And once we go lower than we want to be, it's a lot harder to go back the other way and, and correct it. So it's a good idea to, to, to know what we need first before putting, putting things in. Okay, so that is blueberries and the blueberries generally are pretty much done by late June. That's, that's about as far as we'll get harvest off of blueberries. And uh, these are, so low bush or half high bush. So low bush means that it's in the lower understory and then half high bushes, it's a little bit higher. So, so a little bit, needs a little bit more light than maybe the low the low bush and it's of course it's going to be great for woodland kind of gardens and we can use this in and around things like azaleas or rhododendrons they kind of require that same lower acidity okay now we're going to look at a couple of trees here and so this is prunus cerasus and it, it's not a native, but it is an easy to grow small cherry tree. It's probably, I would say, one of the easier fruit trees to grow. And of course, I love tart cherries. I think it's a, it's a tasty fruit, healthy, all those things. And, uh, but you would, you would want to get the dwarf variety. So that's, that's what to look for. A dwarf Montmorency would be a great addition to an ornamental edible landscape. And so the dwarf varieties get maybe 10 if it's like a semi-dwarf, maybe up to 20 feet or 18 feet tall. So just make sure, again, the space is there for it. And it's uh, drought tolerant, low maintenance. It's got uh, nice white flowers in spring, and then we get cherries in June. And uh, it's a good accent. You could even use it in a small orchard. But it's one of these that here we can see how it's being used in kind of uh, the smaller bed here. So it's something that can fit into a smaller space. And then we have pawpaw. Pawpaw is a very interesting and popular native plant, native fruit tree. And it's a great plant for a hobby orchardist, or if you just wanted it as a specimen. And it's really kind of gaining popularity as, a, as kind of a niche consumer market. And you can find it at farmer's markets. You, you can probably even find it frozen as an ice cream or it's, it's being, it started being used at breweries now. They're mixing, they're, they're creating pawpaw beer. So, so there's this emerging pawpaw market. It's really kind of, kind of cool. And it's very easy to grow. It na it's a native tree, native fruit tree, and it, and it does well in, in shady, wet conditions or shady, dry conditions. So it's very versatile, pretty low maintenance. Uh, the flowers are kind of uh, this interesting purple uh, flower. I wouldn't necessarily say that you're growing it for the flower, but it's this interesting purple flower. Now it's, it's interesting because it, uh, it has a very pungent odor that's, that's uh, described as similar to 
a something decaying, some kind of de decaying for something like that. So it, it's actually pollinated by flies primarily, and that's why it has that kind of stinky decay kind of smell uh, that it uses to attract flies. I think that's interesting. And then it kind of has this oblong brownish fruit. And the fruit is, is kind of similar to banana almost, is a good way to describe it. But the fruit ripen in October, kind of has a, a tropical banana flavor. Uh, and it attracts, uh, again, kind of interesting pollinators. But it does spread by underground rhizomes. So it, it produces those suckers and uh, wants to kind of turn into a grove. So it needs to be, if you don't want that, got to be aware of that. And, uh, but it's a great addition and it's a, it's a fun native edible plant. Okay, last but not least, we've got American persimmon. And this, this Diasporus uh, virginiana is, I believe, there's lots of persimmon species, but this is the only one that's native to the United States, or at least to the Midwest United States. And so it is, uh, and it is a native of Illinois. Now, I've, I've got here that it gets up to 60 feet, and that's just an average, but they can get taller than that. They can get quite a bit taller than that. And in Illinois, the record for persimmon is uh, 135 feet tall, and that's in Wabash County. So that's a neat little piece of trivia. And they are fragrant. The flowers are kind of not really the most showy part of it, I don't think, but they're greenish yellow flowers in late spring. And I think the main feature here is the, the fruit, of course, the persimmon, but it also is a, is a large tree. So this would be something that could be a, an alternative for larger shade trees like a maple or, or maybe even a tulip poplar, something like that, this, or, or a, a honey locust, a thornless honey locust. This might be an alternative landscape tree that we might use for shade as well. But the, the fruit are kind of the main feature here. And so they mature in late fall and they kind of tend to hang on through the winter. But the interesting thing is here, it's, it's always kind of a big question of how to know when the fruit is ripe. So the general rule is that you, they won't be ready until after the first hard frost. And so that's kind of the conventional wisdom of, of the American persimmon. But I, in my experience, it tends to hold more or less true. Uh, here's some other tips to kind of gauge whether the persimmon fruit is ripe. So if it pulls away easily from the branch, and that's, so that's where it kind of re releases, that's where the calyx releases from the branch. So if it just kind of pops off easy, that's a good sign. And then if the four lobe calyx here, this is the calyx that we're talking about, if that can easily be removed from the fruit, that's a good, that, that's a good sign or, or a good uh, clue. And uh, also if the fruit has changed to a deep peach or almost a dark orange color, that's another good, good clue. Also the fruit needs to be, if it's kind of soft and squishy, and if we can peel the skin off easily, that's another test. But the, the ultimate test is tasting and if it tastes sweet, then we know it's good, but you'll know pretty quick if it's not ripe. And I have experience there. So it's really bitter. It just sucks all the life out of your mouth. So you want to try to test all these other things first and then, and then take a little nibble for the taste test. But Dan Nick Rent, Dr. Nick Rent is a, a plant biologist professor. Uh, and uh, this is his site here. And let me see if we can take a quick look at it because it's got a really nice recipe for persimmon. Let me see if we can move this over here. And here we kind of talk about these, these clues here for ripeness, but he's got some other great information here on the American persimmon. And here's a nice recipe for persimmon pudding. All right, and, I, and that's, that link I believe is in the resources but I believe you'll get the slides too, so you can follow that link. And real quick here to, to wrap up, let's take a look at some examples of some edible landscapes. And these are both at the Southern Illinois University Carbondale campus. And this one is on the green roof. So this kind of shows the unique and different places that we can, that we can 
uh, that we can establish edible plantings in, in, uh, in the landscape or that we can introduce edibles. And what we have here is we've got, so this is kind of a, we installed this this summer and we've used mostly all American selections. So these are from the last 10 years, I think of Ameri all American selections. And we kind of have this arch design here with a walkway. So on the backside here, we planted some tomato and pepper varieties. And we've got patio choice yellows, which you can kind of see there. Let me get that pointer back. So those patio yellows, and I mentioned determinant. These are determinant, so they're gonna get to a kind of a set size and they're not gonna get a lot bigger than that. And then we've got some cherry reds or candy lands down here. And then back way on the backside, we've got some uh, red torch. And the red torch are, man, they're really tasty tomatoes. One of my favorites up there. The peppers, we have Mad Hatter, Roulette, Chili Pie, Aji Rico, and Cornito Gallo. So those are just a, kind of a selection of different pepper varieties. Kind of a unique thing here is the okra. This is flaming candle okra, and this is that okra vegetable there. Very interesting looking edible plant, and it's really drought tolerant, which is good because that's a condition we deal with on the green roof. And just a quick note, we had, we did have watermelon back here. So these mini love, they're little miniature watermelons that we were growing in these back beds here. And they were doing pretty good. They were vining out and set uh, some fruit. But one of the big challenges on the green roof, and as is a unique challenge on the green roof, is extreme squirrel predation because we've got these big shade trees all around the roof. And they this is kind of like their personal deck. And they love melons. So as soon as the melons started uh, to start to develop, they just uh, came up and chewed into them and kind of kind of ruined them. So, so the melons are done, but we've got a few other things up here. We've got some of these All-American Winter Zinnias and there's some marigolds in there, but that is the green roof. Now on the ground level is another great example of edible landscaping. And this is again at SIUC. And so here, kind of the main feature that we see are the marigolds. And now these aren't really edible, but they're more kind of, this is more of that ornamental part integrated into edible landscaping. And this is the big one here. This is big duck. And then this one is the, the shorter variety on the border is superhero spry. And in the back here bordering this, we've got tomatoes, uh, early resilience, red torch, peppers it, within here, some, some cayenne and some roulette. And now we've also, we, we've got some pole beans or the variety or the cultivar is Zaychelas. And the major kind of challenge here that we ran into and, and kind of uh, oh, unforeseen circumstances, the deer. So SIUC on the ground, while we're dealing with squirrels on the roof, on the ground level, we have really heavy deer populations. So they just kind of walk right up here and browse on the ten tender vegetation of, of, the, of the pole beans and the tomatoes. And so I don't think they've really done a lot, produced a lot, because as soon as they grow much at all, the, the deer just kind of chew them back. So that was a little bit of a, of, a, uh, of a challenge, I would say there. I'm not sure what we would do to keep them out of there. And then we did have strawberry too in here, and they, they just chomped those down as well. So, so that was a little bit of a, a lesson there on, on what the deer like. And so just to wrap up here, so whether you're interested in using herbs and flowers and containers or, in, or maybe integrating vegetables and fruits into the landscape, there's, I think that I, I hope that uh, we've introduced you to some, some options here. There's lots and lots of ornamental edibles to play with in the garden. And here's just a few examples of, of how they've used them at the Chicago Botanical Gardens from their edible landscaping exhibits here. And so it's just kind of show, showcasing how you can integrate edible plants into small spaces. Here we've got fig, uh, fig trees, which are, which are neat and um, kind of in these little beds here along the wall. Here we've got some kind of colorful amaranth here, 
cabbage with uh, sweet alyssum along there. So these are just a few examples, some, some really nice examples of, of what, what, what can be done with edible landscaping. And here are uh, a list of resources, and these will also be sent to you so that you can access these. This is my contact info. So if there's anything that we don't cover today or we didn't talk about, uh, please uh, feel free to contact me. And you can view past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening Series on the University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube channel here. And then there is a link to register for our upcoming webinars. I think this is the last summer webinar. And so the, the, the fall series is coming up. And I, that wraps it up. So if we've got questions, I think we've got some time to answer any questions you might have.